Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome everybody to our program this evening, Creating Habitat with Native Wildflowers. Uh, my name is Heather Obera. I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator with Alachua Conservation Trust, and I'm joined tonight by Grace Howell, who is the Conservation Programs Coordinator with Alachua Conservation Trust, as well as Stacy Matrazzo, who is the program manager for the Florida Wildflower Foundation. And Stacy is going to be our guest speaker this evening, and we're very excited to have her here. Uh, I'd like to go over just a few logistics before we get started. Then I'm gonna turn the program over to Grace to introduce Stacy, and uh, looking forward to seeing her presentation in a few moments. Uh, first of all, if you're new to Alachua Conservation Trust, we are a nonprofit land trust that works to protect the natural, scenic, historic, and recreational resources in and around North Central Florida. We protect land through acquisition, donation, and conservation easements in 16 counties in North Central Florida. Tonight's presentation is part of the Keep Florida Wild virtual series, which is a series of uh, different webinar programs on conservation topics that we host each month. If you'd like to support future environmental education programs like the one that we're having tonight, uh, please feel free to text the word Florida Wild to 44321. And we greatly appreciate that support. I will also include that in the chat later on so that you can get that information if you need it. Uh, also, if you know someone who wasn't able to get to the program tonight or wasn't able to register before we filled up, uh, we can actually, uh, you can actually watch this program on YouTube right now. Uh, and so we've got some folks watching through YouTube. And uh, if you're on YouTube and watching this program, please feel free to use the chat if you'd like to, and I'll be monitoring that as well this evening. Lastly, there will be a Q&A uh, following Stacy's presentation. Uh, so please feel free to submit your questions either through the Q&A or the chat uh, in Zoom and also through the chat on YouTube. And uh, we'll be uh, taking those questions after Stacy's presentation. Please note that even though you are able to raise your hand during this presentation, we cannot call on anyone. We cannot acknowledge uh, cameras or anything like that. So please feel free to use the Q&A and also the chat options to get any of your questions in this evening. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Grace who is going to introduce Stacy, and we'll get started with our presentation. Thank you everyone for being here. Grace. Hi, um, thanks a lot for joining us. And I'd like to say a big thank you to Stacy Matrazzo for joining us today. Um, Stacy is a dear friend of mine and so I'm very excited to have her on our webinar as well. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about her. Um, she is the program manager for the Florida Wild Wildflower Foundation, and she is an environmental educator with a bachelor's degree in environmental studies and a master's degree in liberal studies from Rollins College, where she is also an adjunct professor. Um, she is a native Floridian, and Stacy is also a certified master naturalist. And she spends much of her free time kayaking, hiking, birding, and photographing Florida's amazing natural environments. She has been conducting native plant and edible plant hikes for 10 years and is the co-author of Native Plants for Florida Gardens with Nancy Bissett. Um, I have been, uh, I have been, had the, the joy of being able to go out in the woods with Stacy and join her on some of these hikes. Um, she's a very knowledgeable botanist. I met her at a Florida Native Plant Society conference several years back where we discovered that we are very compatible flower hunters. Um, since then, we've been on many adventures and most of them involved slogging through swamps and uh, hiking through tick infested forests and uh, looking for milkweeds and orchids and pitcher plants and everything in between. Um, Stacy always stops to sp smell the flowers and she shares wonderful bits of information about their natural history. And I have learned a lot from her. Um, she's a teacher, a researcher, an adventurer, and there's not many people that I would rather be in the woods with. So with no further ado, I will hand this over to Stacy to uh, give you all of her wonderful information. Thank you, Grace. Um, that was such a wonderful introduction. And um, I ditto to all of that. I've had so many wonderful adventures with you. Um, slogging through bods, bogs. It's amazing. Um, so thank you for um, having me. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And um, start my slideshow. <laughs> Sorry. I've done this a bazillion times and yet each time I'm like, what do I do? 
Um, so yeah, I'm Stacey Matrazer. I'm here to talk to you about creating habitat with native wildflowers. Um, if you're not familiar with the organization, the Florida Wildflower Foundation, um, our mission is to protect, connect, and expand native wildflower habitats through um, our education, research, and planting and conservation programs. We do this primarily through funds um, received from the sale or renewal of the state wildflower license plate. And um, that was our old look. We now have this um, much nicer, newer design, but whether you have the old look or the new, those funds allow us to um, do the work that we do to provide grants for native plant demonstration and school gardens throughout the state, um, conduct research on many horticultural topics of in relevance to both uh, commercial and residential interests, to produce an array of helpful handouts and brochures on plant selection, growing, maintaining plants, attracting wildlife, and much, much, much more. Um, we'd like to encourage those of you who find our programs valuable to consider becoming a member, making a donation, or purchasing the state wildflower license plate. So I'm here to talk to you about creating habitat in our urban landscapes. Um, but why habitat, right? Why not just beauty or I like this plant or this does well here. So, you know, what, what makes a landscape a habitat and why does it matter? Well, Florida is one of the most biodiverse states in the country. We have about 2,800 uh, native plant species here including more ancient species and uh, more families than any other state in the country. But we are also one of the fastest growing states in the country. And so as our natural lands succumb to this increasing development to accommodate this growth, we're losing this diversity of plants and animals that is so vital to Florida. And this is important to us too, because diversity is the web of life. All species are interconnected. Um, certain plants rely on certain animals for survival and vice versa. We need healthy soils, clean water. We as humans rely on pollinators for, you know, 75% or more of our food production. But all life is interconnected. And that's a topic uh, that could be its own presentation. But I'm here to talk to you about what we can do to help mitigate that loss of diversity. So as Doug Tallamy points out, and if you're not familiar with Doug Tallamy, you really should be. Um, he's the author of several books on the importance of using native plants in our landscapes. Um, he presented a webinar for us last May for the Wildflower Foundation um, that you can view on our website and YouTube channel. So if you, if you don't know him, check him out. He has done some incredible research. But he says biodiversity can't be sustained in habitat fragments. They're too small and too isolated. So again, we're developing our natural lands so quickly, they're becoming smaller and more isolated. We're essentially creating islands of habitat surrounded by these bigger burgeoning urban areas. But we can use our urban landscapes to help bridge that divide or that gap between these fragmented natural areas and provide habitat and pathways for birds, pollinators, other wildlife where they can find food shelter and the resources they need to survive and perform those ecosystem services that we rely on them for. for. Um, so how do we do this? Well, again, to quote Doug Tallamy, we need to raise the bar for what we ask our landscapes to do. We do so much to care for our yards, but we should be insisting that our landscapes give something back, you know, not just to us, but to all the wildlife that have been displaced as a result of our um, urban settings. And we can do this really easily by reducing the amount of turf grass and non-native plants in our yards and incorporating more native species. So, you know, with turf grass, we mow, we herbicide, we put pesticides, we do all this stuff that, uh, you know, takes time, takes energy, is, is harmful in many respects, to produce something that serves no ecological value. St. Augustine grass is basically a, a dead zone, ecologically speaking. It takes our time and energy and, and nothing in return, so let's get rid of it or at least reduce it. You don't have to get rid of every bit of your landscape, of your yard, if you have you know, animals that need pa grass patches or 
small children that want to run and play in it, you know, there's, there's room for it, but it doesn't need to consume your entire landscape. We also want to transition from those commonly used non-native ornamentals that, you know, you can buy at your big box garden centers and you see them all over our, um, you know, housing developments that are popping up all over the place. They have little ecological value or worse, they might even be invasive species that are disrupting the function of our natural ecosystems. You may not realize it, but many of those common landscape plants are actually categorized as invasives. This means that in the natural world, that plant has displaced a native plant or hybridized with a native plant or altered the ecological function of a habitat or an ecosystem or otherwise just caused ecological damage. Um, lantana is um, you know, a very common landscape plant. Yes, pollinators like it, but you will see it taking over natural areas throughout the state. It's toxic to some animals, um, particularly cattle, and it's very difficult to eradicate. We do have native lantanas, but this is not one of them. Uh, Mexican petunia is another very common landscape choice for housing developments and uh, urban landscapes. Uh, most are now a sterile variety, which sellers will tout as a positive. No seeds, so no spread, right? Wrong! <laughs> this plant spreads by underground rhizomes, so even though it is sterile, it doesn't matter. It still has invasive tendencies, and on top of that, if you have it in your landscape, nobody's going to know whether you have the sterile variety or not. So having it is still promoting the use of that invasive species. And that's something we you know, don't really want to do. And of course, because of the way it spreads, it's very difficult to eradicate once it is present. Um, creeping oxide is another very common landscape plant found in moist and coastal areas. It's another spreader. And boy, does it ever. It will take over if you let it. Um, fountain grass, another very common um, landscape plant um, that offers, um, you know, it doesn't need a lot of maintenance, but it doesn't offer anything except, again, the potential spread where it's not wanted. Tropical milkweed is not an invasive species yet, but it is not native, and it is naturalizing in parts of the state where, um, well, throughout the state. You'll find it in natural areas where it really shouldn't be. Um, it has other problems too. The plant doesn't die back in winter, which our native milkweeds do. And so this year round food source can be problematic to migrating butterfly species. Um, it's often treated with systemic insecticides, which means you're basically providing poisoned food to your caterpillars. And it's also linked to the transmission of OE, which is a parasite that affects monar monarchs. Um, this is another presentation unto itself, and that's not what I'm here to talk to you about. Um, but if you're interested in learning more, we do have a great resource on our website that talks about the problems with tropical milkweed. So again, not invasive, but still a non-native um, plant that's commonly used that does have some problems to consider. And these are just a handful of the many, many plants that are commonly used in landscapes that have a lot of um, other problems to be aware of. And there aren't any laws prohibiting the sale or use of these plants. So they're often readily available at your big box garden centers. They look nice and they're promoted as easy to grow. But remember, if you use them in your landscape, you're not necessarily providing the resources that native plants can provide. And you may be contributing to an ecological problem or at the very least promoting the use of a potential ecological problem. So something to think about. Um, plants need to do more than just be pretty. They should play a role in your landscape's ecosystem. So yes, landscape, uh, your landscape, your yard can and should be an ecosystem, a habitat. We want to invite wildlife into our landscapes. And again, we can do this easily by planting natives, removing invasives, and reducing or eliminating the non-natives, including turf grass. And when we do this, we can encourage our neighbors to do the same. When they walk by and see your beautiful native plants alive with activities from birds and butterflies and bees and all kinds of great wildlife, they're going to want to do this too. And so in this way, we're helping to create habitat in our urban areas 
and create pathways of habitat between our natural areas. If I do it, my neighbor does it, and so on and so forth, we've got a nice pathway of, of resources for wildlife. So as I mentioned earlier, Florida is home to 2,800, give or take, native plant species. These plants um, have evolved with our state's unique conditions. Um, they are acclimated to our soils, to our climates. They've evolved adaptations that help them survive drought and salt and hurricane winds and seasonal climate fluctuations. And so they're better suited than many of these non-native species to survive in, in what can be very harsh conditions. And they're better equipped to provide appropriate food and habitat to our native wildlife, including those pollinators that we need for our own food production. Uh, native plants require less water if you use the right plant in the right place, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, they require little to no fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, which, you know, the plants that did not evolve here require those things. They're not used to the conditions. They aren't used to our native pests, quote unquote. Our native plants also give back to our soils. They add those nutrients back in um, that can then help sustain other plants and organisms. They help control erosion, they beautify our landscapes, and they are an essential part of a healthy, diverse environment. And good habitat demands diversity. By this, I mean, you don't want your landscape to be a monoculture. You don't want to put all the effort of going native in and you know, put 16 plants of the same species, for example. So diversity of habitat means diversity of, or excuse me, diversity in your landscape means um, diversity of plant habit, which means um, different heights, different structures, different types of plants in your yard. So wildflowers uh, in particular can create a really nice aesthetic, um, but they also provide pollen and nectar. They provide nesting opportunities for insects and they provide seeds for birds. And the insects that, uh, that, that utilize them also are attractive treats for birds and other wildlife as well. Um, vines are great for adding vertical interest and um, density and cover. Uh, they're great when you have limited space and you can just, you know, plant up instead of out. Grasses are another good thing to incorporate when you're building habitat. Grasses, um, grasses give texture and movement to a landscape while also providing that food and cover. And they literally help support wildflowers. When you go out in nature, you know, these plants occur and they're closely um, you know, growing together and, and they're literally helping to keep each other up. So it's good to have grasses in your wildflower gardens or in your um, native plant landscape to, to offer that support, but again, also provide those resources that wildlife depend on. And then of course, trees and shrubs are also essential to a really healthy, sustainable landscape. Um, they can act as centerpieces, or you can plant a bunch of them together if you are looking for a hedge or a screen or privacy buffer or something like that. But trees and shrubs host a variety of microhabitats. Um, they too provide cover, um, nesting opportunities for birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, everything utilizes trees and shrubs. So again, diversity of habit, lots of different types of plants, different heights, different structures, providing different resources. You also want diversity of bloom time, particularly for pollinators who require um, nectar and pollen. Um, you want plants that are gonna be blooming throughout the year. So you wanna include a diversity of species so that you've always got those resources available no matter what time of year or what season it is. Um, you um, also want to include not only nectar and pollen resources, but host plants as well. Many of our um, insects, butterflies in particular, require specific plants to um, lay their eggs on in which the caterpillars will hatch and eat um, in order to then move on in their life cycle. Milkweed is a great example of that. Without milkweeds, we don't get monarchs or queens or soldiers. So you want to have um, 
host plants in your landscape as well. Um, also consider a diversity of fruiting or seeding times. So generally, if you've got things blooming throughout the year, you're gonna have things that are producing fruit and seed throughout the year. But that is something also to consider. Um, you know, our mammals, our birds require fruit, berries, um, nuts, seeds. So you want things that are gonna be available throughout the year. And of course, choose plants that provide nesting materials and dense foliage where wildlife can seek shelter, build nests, take cover if necessary. And if you can, um, you can also include other resources like a brush pile or a water feature or a bee condo or you know, any other enhancement that can just, again, add um, a level of resources for wildlife in your landscape and attract them. Um, oh gosh, there's the slide that should have gone with the whole thing I just said. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, yes, yeah, so diversify your landscape, um, include a variety of things, and, and make sure you've got all your bases covered for um, all the, the creatures that are going to be utilizing your landscape. You also want to make sure that you're selecting the right plant for the right place. Um, you know, is your landscape mostly sunny or is it covered in shade? Is your soil moist or dry? These are things that are going to um, determine what plants are going to do well in your landscape. What part of the state do you live in? If you live in Tallahassee and you happen to be in Miami and buy a plant that's only suited for that area, it's probably not going to survive in your landscape. Many of our native plants do well throughout the state. Um, but you do want to make sure that you're not getting one that, you know, is endemic to the Keys because it's probably not going to do well um, in high springs, for example. So these are all factors that are going to affect whether or not the plant you choose will survive and it's going to dictate how much maintenance is required. When you buy plants, uh, make sure you buy from trusted sources. So um, you, you want to go to plantrealflorida.org. This is the Florida Association of Native Nurseries. You can find a, a nursery in your area. When, um, excuse me, if you go to a nursery that is growing these plants, they're going to know um, things like where the plant is originally from. For example, milkweed are, is native to many parts of this country. So a lot of times the milkweed that you buy in the big box store, even though it's native to Florida, it's actually um, harvested for or grown from seed from Colorado. Well, that seed is acclimated to high altitude and um, you know, colder temperatures, different soil types. So it may not do as well here in Florida when you put it in your landscape. But if you go to nurseries that know, you know they're doing the growing, they're, they're um, harvesting the seed, they're going to be able to tell you exactly where that plant came from. And they're going to know what's been done to that plant. Has it been treated with those systemic insecticides? You want to know this. Most of the plants you find, many of the plants you find at the big box stores, have been treated because they want them to look good. They want you to see this beautiful plant and go, oh my gosh, I want to buy that. But when you take it home, again, it's, you know, it's putting some, some bad things into your landscape, potentially. Um, so again, go to plantrealflorida.org, find a nursery in your area that specializes in native plants, and you will be able to get all your questions answered. If you're interested in growing from seed, you can visit the Florida Wildflowers uh, Seed Growers Cooperative at floridawildflowers.com. Um, or a Native Plant Society chapter plant sale is usually a good place to um, find what you're looking for as well. And finally, make sure you're not purchasing plants that are invasive. Um, visit flepsy.org to see a comprehensive list of plants that are invasive. Um, you know, non-native species may not be a deal breaker, but invasive species should be a hard no for your landscape. So I'm just going to talk about a few plants that are really easy to, um, to grow in a landscape. They're easy to maintain, again, in the right conditions, um, and they provide resources for wildlife. And these are just some of my favorites that I'm highlighting. This is Florida Green Eyes. Um, this is a lower one to one and a half foot tall wildflower that um, it's a perennial that once it's established creates these large clumps of many, many blooms, bright yellow, beautiful aster blooms. Um, it's very attractive to bees and butterflies. 
It blooms uh, generally spring and summer, but um, as you get a little further south, it can bloom year round. It's very easy to establish, has a super thick tuberous root. So once it gets established, it's incredibly drought tolerant. Um, it does great in dry soils and um, full sun. And it has a secret. Um, <laughs> this is one that Grace and I actually learned about on one of our trips, um, but all of the green eyes have this secret. When the disc florets, those are the little flowers in the middle, are open and they kind of get that maroon color, they emit this subtle chocolate scent and it is so delightful. Um, it doesn't last very long, so if you have it in your landscape, you really want to keep an eye on the blooms because you don't want to miss it. But um, I have some in my front yard and I love when it, uh, when it smells like chocolate. I get a little giddy about it. Um, partridge pea is a, a great one, again, for attracting butterflies, um, bees, especially long-tongued bees, which are its uh, only actual pollinator. And it's a larval host for uh, several butterflies. It has nectar glands on the leaf stems that attract a variety of like ants and flies and other insects that are then attractive to birds. And birds also like the seeds. This is generally an annual or short-lived perennial, so it does disappear on you, but it's a prolific self-seeder, so it's gonna be regenerating itself in your landscape. It's in the pea family, so it's a nitrogen fixer, which means it might also improve your soil and allow you to introduce some more demanding plants in your landscape. And it's a really nice one to have in your landscape because it's really um, just interesting to look at. It has these kind of ferny, feathery leaves, the stems are red, it's got this cool yellow flower, so it, you know, it adds interest, but it also provides uh, resources. Um, twin flower is, um, again, it's another host plant. This is a common buckeye host, but also attractive to bees, butterflies. Um, it has a really long bloom period, spring through fall, although again, further south, it can bloom year round. It's exceptionally adaptable, um, it spreads fairly rapidly by underground runners and by self-sown seed, but it's easy to maintain and, and contain as well. Um, it's an excellent ground cover. You can mow right over it and it'll pop back up and sprout more flowers. Um, it's pretty drought tolerant, can handle some shade, so very um, adaptable to lots of conditions. And it has this beautiful little purple flower. If you live in a moist area or perhaps you live on a you know, retention pond or in a, on a wetland, um, this is a really nice one to consider. It, it does need full sun. This is scarlet hibiscus. Um, but it is one of our most showiest wildflowers. The blooms are as big as my hand, maybe bigger. Um, this is a good one for attracting hummingbirds. Hummingbirds love red and they love tubular flowers. So this is a great one for attracting them as well as butterflies and other pollinators. It blooms in the summer. Um, and the bloom's only open for a day, but it's a pretty profuse bloomer. So um, it does have a lot of blooms like coming right behind them as they close up. So it's really good for, again, moist or wet landscapes. It does not like dry at all, it can, but it can handle inundation. It can sit in standing water. Um, it's also nice, um, you can keep it in a pot and add it to a water feature or like a small pond in your landscape as well. And I should say, or should have said, all of these plants that I'm talking about are suitable for Alachua County. Uh, I believe you guys are in zone 9A, I think. Um, but all the plants I've included um, extend beyond that range. So they're all um, suitable for that part of the state. Um, this is blazing star. We have about four species of, uh, of Liatris or blazing star that are typically available at native nurseries. And they range from dry to wet conditions um, they are all excellent nectar plants, um, great for attracting butterflies, moths, bees, other insects, even hummingbirds on rare occasion. Birds love the seeds. I just added eight uh, blazing stars to my landscape over the weekend. Um, this is a good one to pair with a bunch grass, and I have a couple bunch grasses I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but it really just makes a nice display. Um, it has a, this long wand-like purple flower. Um, it's great if you have a small garden because even though it's tall, it can get up to four feet or so, it doesn't spread out. So it, it doesn't require a lot of horizontal space. 
So it's good for even small spaces, even though it does get um, kind of tall. This is one that there are quite a few non-native liatris or blazing stars that are typically sold at your garden, big box garden centers. And they're generally not the natives and not from, uh, not from here. So again, be, be aware of what you're getting um, depending on where you're shopping. Um, dotted horse mint is probably the best like bang for your buck plant when it comes to pollinators. I have never seen more diversity of pollinators on a wildflower than I have on dotted horse mint. It attracts these craziest wasps and yes wasps are pollinators too and they are they're very beneficial insects so um, you know there are a lot of people don't care for them but they, they do a good job and they love horse mint as well as bees and butterflies. Um, this is another one that has a really long bloom time. Um, I think I have summer and fall here on here, but it can bloom as early as spring. Um, the plant is in the mint family and it is high in a chemical called thymol or thymol, which is also present in thyme, the spice or herb. And it has kind of a similar scent to it. It smells a little bit like oregano or thyme. Um, you can dry the, the leaves and make a tea out of it that can pr help promote relaxation, kind of like chamomile-ish tea. Um, so it's kind of nice to have in your landscape for that reason. Or you can do like me and just kind of brush against it just to make it emit that gorgeous, gorgeous smell. Um, it does like to spread on its own. It produces a lot of seed and it can, it can take over if you let it. But you can um, cut it back before seed sets or just, um, you know, occasionally pulling out those seedlings if you want to keep it in a smaller space. And it can get pruned back too. So while it can get up to four feet, you can prune it uh, and keep it at a smaller size. It's pretty adaptable in that respect. Um, this plant is known by a bazillion common names. I like frog fruit because I just like to imagine frogs eating fruit. But it's also known as turkey tangle. Um, fog fruit, I'm not sure what that means, cape weed, match head, because it looks like a little match head, um, creeping charlie, carpet weed, because it forms these lovely dense carpets or mats. Whatever you want to call it, it is one of our most versatile and vital um, wildflowers, ground covers. It's very low growing, only a few inches, but it can bloom year round. And if you have a St. Augustine grass uh, or St. Augustine lawn, and you're watering it a bit, uh, you might be seeing this in there. It, it is, um, a lot of people consider it a weed. If you have St. Augustine, you don't want this showing up. So it, it gets that horrible bad rap as a weed, but it's actually a really excellent native pollinator plant. It is um, a larval host for the white peacock, the common buckeye, and a couple other butterflies. It's very attractive to small pollinators, bees, butterflies. Um, it blooms year round. You can mow it and it'll come back. It, it likes to get mowed. Um, it's very adaptable, very tolerant to conditions. And you can even put it in a hanging basket and it does really well too. So um, excellent, excellent plant and a good ground cover for a sunny to partial shade and kind of um, moderately dry to moist habitat or have landscape. This is another uh, member of the mint family. Um, it too produces um, edible leaves. You can make a tea out of it. This one's a little more minty, almost lemony, whereas the um, dotted horse mint is more savory mint. Um, but this is a good one for providing resources early in the year. It blooms uh, late winter and spring. So it's available, it's nectar and pollen is available when a lot of other plants have yet to bloom. So, you know, again, nice to have in your landscape to consider the seasons and provide that resource. Um, this one does, can, can get a little woody, um, but it's pretty low growing and it, it can spread out a little bit. Um, but again, delightfully aromatic, um, really does great in dry, sandy soils, um, very drought tolerant, likes a lot of sun, um, and um, does pretty well in nutrient poor soils. It doesn't really need a whole lot, so it's good in those kind of harsh conditions. It's typically found in scrub habitat where there's, you know, not a whole lot of nutrients in the soil, so good if you, if that's what your landscape is like. 
Um, this is uh, our native petunia. It is the same genus as that invasive um, Mexican petunia I showed you earlier, but it's a little bit different. Um, the Mexican petunia gets a couple feet high, whereas this is much more uh, low growing, about usually around a foot tall or so. Um, but this is another good one for attracting bees, butterflies. Um, it's a, another larval host for the common buckeye. Has a very long bloom time, spring through fall, year round as you get further south. Um, it is uh, another one where the flowers only last a day, but it has lots and lots and lots of bloom. So um, it, the plant always looks fresh. It's always got something going on. Um, it does great in full sun to full shade, but you will get denser foliage and more blooms if it has more sun exposure. So um, good in, if, if you have a full shade, you're still gonna get some, but uh, it's just not gonna be quite as prolific as um, you know, partial shade or, or full sun. Um, this is another one that can be mowed and it will come back and flower. Um, and it also is a really good self seeder. So it's gonna continue to um, spread in your landscape if you let it. Uh, this is a cool one because it projects its seeds and I've only heard this once, but you're in the landscape at the right time you can actually hear it like pop, shoot its seed off. And it's really, it's very spectacular. Um, but you know, you gotta be there at the right time to experience that. So um, this one also does well in a hanging basket or a container. So very, very versatile. Um, but again, resources for pollinators. We have quite a few um, salvia plants or sage plants that are native to Florida. These are probably the two most commonly found ones. Um, on the left, you see lyre lead sage, which is um, Salvia lyrata. It is our kind of our early bloomer. It actually blooms uh, late winter and spring. So again, another one that provides resources um, when they are typically few. Whereas um, tropical sage on the right has uh, it's usually summer and fall, but the ones in my landscape, I planted them last March and they have yet to stop producing flowers. So they're just going nuts. And I'm in Orlando, so a little bit further south, but um, still in an area where, um, you know, maybe they, they should take a break, but I'm loving it. Um, this is, they're both great for butterflies and bees. Tropical sage also is good for um, hummingbirds. Again, that red tubular flower that hummingbirds are looking for. Um, there you go. They both do great in mixed wildflower gardens. Um, tropical sage likes a little more sun than wire leaf sage, but they both do pretty well in partial shade. Um, moist to dry landscapes. They're really very forgiving, especially the tropical sage. Um, it, it doesn't ask for much and they, it readily reseeds. So I will tell you, I have one I'm looking at it in my backyard and it has sent babies all over the place. So I've been potting them and just giving them away because I there's there's so many of them, but um, it's great. If you have one, you've got, you know, 20 or more. Um, we have a few golden rods that are typically available at your native nurseries. Um, this is pretty much, this is the most common one you'll find, seaside golden rod. Um, it can get pretty tall and it can spread pretty easily. Um, it spreads by underground rhizomes, so it does want to make a really nice dense colony. Um, if you can plant it where you have space and it can put on its big show, then let it go because it is quite amazing. Um, it does need a lot of sun to bloom it at its best, but it can tolerate some shade and it's salt tolerant hence the name seaside goldenrod. It's often found um, along the coast, but it does well inland as well. Um, people often mistake uh, goldenrod as an allergen. A lot of people think they're allergic to goldenrod, uh, but goldenrod, it, it, its pollen is very sticky. It's not wind dispersed. So it really is unlikely that it's triggering allergies. It does occur in the same habitat and blooms at the same time of year as ragweed, which we all know is a horrible allergen, and ragweed pollen is wind dispersed. So um, if you think you're allergic to goldenrod, maybe give it a try or, you know, maybe go seek it out in its natural environment and, and test it out because most likely it is not the goldenrod that um, you're allergic to, which is great. This is a really good one for um, attracting not only insects, which you can see here on the picture, 
but birds love it because it's so covered in insects. So they can come and feast on it um, while those insects are also trying to feast. Um, it blooms summer through fall, can bloom, you know, again, a little bit longer in southern part of the state. But um, again, it, it really does best when it has the space. So if you don't have a lot of space for it, um, it might not be the plant for you. That said, I have some in a small little garden um, outside of my house and it, it's doing okay. I am seeing it sprouting in areas that I didn't plant it in, but um, you know, that's a bonus when you get extra plants, right? Um, okay, grasses, uh, how are we doing on time? Okay, I think I'm okay. Um, I mentioned grasses as being a, a really important component in a habitat landscape. Um, again, grasses, we have a, a lot of bunch grasses here and bunch grasses are great because they are evergreen. So they look great in the landscape all year, but they also provide that dense foliage and cover throughout the year. And they um, provide seed for birds typically. This is um, Elliot's love grass, which is again, a bunch grass. Um, it's a larval host for the Zabulon skipper. And you can see in this picture, um, the tiny seeds, it, it just produces tons and tons of these, these wispy um, kind of, I'll say tumbleweed only in how they blow off the plant, but they're not round like that. But these, these wands of seeds um, that are, again, a food source for birds, but also just a really stunning thing to have in your landscape. Um, most of our grasses here in Florida, or most of our bunch grasses, really need to be burned to produce seed at their like best or at their you know fullest capability. Um, and of course, in our landscape, we can't do that. But you can cut them back to kind of min minimally mimic the effect of fire, um, and like you can cut them back just as a um, you know a maintenance mechanism, I suppose, if you want to trim them back and, and let them, if they're getting too big. But they do remain attractive all year round and um, they're just absolutely lovely. We have a purple love grass too and the flower head is um, purple instead of the white that you see here. Muley grass is another um, bunch grass that is an evergreen. It's excellent cover for wildflower and it's fall display of color is nothing short of spectacular, especially if you have, you know, a few of them planted together and you can get this just boom, huge display. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, but you can use it as a specimen plant too. Single plant will give you um, just as much delight. Um, it, this has, you know, like kind of dark, darker green needle-like leaves. Um, so very different from the um, Elliot Slovegrass. In my landscape, I've paired them together. So getting kind of a um, diversity of color and form. Um, I planted them with the Liatris that I just bought too. So it should, should look really awesome in the fall. Uh, but this plant is pretty suitable for just about any landscape. It is drought tolerant, but it can handle some uh, moisture. It can handle salt and wind and just about anything you throw at it, um, and it self seeds, so it will maintain its population for quite some time. Um, I also mentioned shrubs and trees, so I'm gonna talk about a few of those. We have a lot of flowering shrubs and trees that aren't technically wildflowers, but again, unless you have a meadow or a prairie for your landscape, you really wanna have that diversity of habit, of plant form. So, um, you know, make sure that you're looking for Plant, shrubs and trees that fit into your conditions, fit into um, you know the size of your landscape, but also provide stunning beauty like this coral bean and resources for hummingbird. Because yep, you guessed it, red tubular flowers, hummingbirds love them. Um, coral bean is another early flower. Um, this one can be deciduous or evergreen. Um, depending on the conditions, mine have all been deciduous, uh, much to my uh, disdain, because I really love the leaf, and I don't have a picture of it here, but the leaf is kind of this deltoid shaped. It's really got just a, a cool leaf. Um, obviously, it's flower. It's a big um, spike of these beautiful red flowers. Um, the branches are armed, so you do want to handle this plant with care, but it is a good one to use in a place where you maybe want to discourage access. So under or near a window or, you know, somewhere where you don't want people climbing around because um, 
the plant can deter that. The seeds in this plant are toxic. So you do want to keep them away from um, pets and small children. This is a member of the bean or pea family. So it has a long pod that it produces with these stunning red seeds, but they're they are toxic. So you don't want any of your kids or animals putting them in your mouth, in their mouth. Um, this is uh, Yelp and Holly, one of several hollies that are typically available at our native nurseries. This is our only plant native to North America that is caffeinated. It contains caffeine. And you can dry the leaves or even use fresh leaves and make a really nice caffeinated tea. Um, we actually have commercial production of it here in the state now, a company called Galpin Brothers, which you may be familiar with, but they are producing um, wild harvested dried um, Galpin Holly tea and it is just delightful. I have a few in my landscape too, um, and I can't do coffee much anymore. The caffeine really gets to me, but this has a, the way the caffeine's assimilated in your body is different. So it, it's really kind of nice and um, just nice to have. Um, but the plant is just so perfect for wildlife because it has dense foliage year round. It's an evergreen. Um, it produces these beautiful little white flowers that bees and other small insects love. It produces tons and tons of red berries that birds just absolutely devour. Had a mockingbird on mine the other day that was just gorging itself. I don't know where they were going because this bird is only, you know, yay big and it ate its, its body size in, um, in berries. Um, other mammals like the fruit too, but the birds um, seem to particularly enjoy them. This is one that you can prune really easily. You can have it as a specimen or um, put a bunch together to make a buffer or a screen. Um, it's very adaptable to many soil types. Um, it is dioecious, so it does, you do need a male and a female to ensure pollination. Um, but again, if you go to a nursery that specializes in native plants, um, they know this, they are growing them and, and um, you know, can tell you which ones you want and ensure that you're gonna have the resources you want in your landscape. If you are uh, familiar with Suriname cherry, which is a very common landscape plant that is invasive, um, this is its native cousin. And it's pretty much, um, you know, looks very similar in the landscape. The leaves have a really nice, like uh, citrusy, piney scent when you crush them, just like the Suriname cherry. Um, you see the, the beautiful little white starbursty kind of flowers that the stopper plant produces. It also um, has a fruit that's edible, just like the Suriname cherry. Um, I keep saying this because I'm trying to say, if you have a Suriname cherry and you like it, you can get rid of it and replace it with this and it'll be, you won't even know the difference. Um, you see in the picture, the immature berries, which are white, but once they mature, they get this nice orangey reddish color. Um, they're edible. The seeds are a little bitter and I don't particularly enjoy them, but the flesh is really nice and sweet, kind of like a sweet um, tomato. But the plant is, again, another great one for wildlife. It's evergreen, dense foliage. Um, the flowers and fruits kind of uh, are produced around the same time and it has a pretty long bloom time of spring, summer, sometimes into fall. So it's a really nice ornamental plant because it has this nice character to it, these cool flowers and um, you know, nice dark foliage. And again, great, great wildlife re resources, especially for birds who just love the, um, the fruit. We have some really important um, plants for in our landscapes here in Florida, um, pine, oak, and saw palmetto, all of which I will get to. Here you see um, slash pine. Um, pine is just an important part of Florida's ecology. And this pine in particular is really fast growing. Um, all pines provide vital food and habitat for the entire spectrum of wildlife. Um, Mammals utilize the trees, reptiles, um, birds use the, the trees for nesting cavities. Um, the flaky bark is really good habitat for insects, which in turn provide those vital proteins to baby birds. Um, squirrels and other mammals eat the cones, they eat the seeds from the cones. 
So it's just, a, a, you know, it's a really good plant if you have the right conditions and the right space for it. It's also edible to us. Um, it's kind of mostly famine food, but you can make a sun tea out of the leaves. You can use it like you would rosemary. Um, the catkins are really high in protein. It's just an all around, you know, amazing plant for all uh, wildlife, including humans. Um, but it's a good one. Um, you know, again, if you have the right conditions for it, it it's a nice specimen tree. Um, if you, you know, if you want to add or create high pink canopy, because it does get pretty tall, it can get up to 100 feet tall. Um, but it's pretty adaptable to conditions. And the fallen needles provide a constant source of mulch. And if you have wildflowers in particular in your landscape that you're relying on reseeding themselves, pine straw is really the mulch that you want to use. Um, if you have a real dense layer of mulch, you know, pine bark or some of these other, um, heaven forbid, it's cy cypress mulch. Please don't use cypress mulch. Um, it's, it's wrecking our, our natural cypress forest. Um, but any of those really heavy, thicker mulches are going to just, you know, cover the ground in a way that will not allow seeds to actually make contact with the soil. And so you're not going to get a lot of regeneration of those wildflowers. But with pine straw, Pine, the way they cut, it's like pickup sticks, you know, they all lay over each other, but there's always access. There's always, um, you know, that the, the holes, if you will, between the pine needles. So if you have a pine or can put a pine in your landscape, you have a constant source of great mulch material for um, your wildflower uh, understory. This is one of our native plums. Um, this, so this is another deciduous um, perennial, so it does lose its leaves uh, in late winter, but in spring, right before it leaves out, it will be just completely covered in these beautiful white, very interesting looking blooms. Um, we have a couple different prunes that, prunes, plums, that um, are available, and they all have the same feature. Um, this one, Chickasaw plum, actually um, suckers. It has a tendency to sucker, so it can form thickets, which may be not desirable um, depending on your situation. Um, Flatwoods plum looks very similar, that's Prunus umbellata, um, and it does not sucker. So if you're concerned about that, you can get a Flatwoods plum. It's um, suitable for North and Central Florida and, um, you know, offers the same features in the landscape. Um, bees love these flowers, um, as do other pollinators, and then it produces these um, you know, large marble-sized plums that um, birds and other wildlife really like. Humans can eat them too. They can be a little tart and it does have a large seed, so it's not always um, the best fruit, but you can make jelly out of it. So yeah. <laughs> you add sugar to anything and it's probably going to be good. Um, I think I'm getting a little close on time, but I just have a couple more plants I want to talk about. I mentioned oaks earlier. Um, oaks are another essential plant for wildlife. Um, they provide food, shelter, they support so many insects that also provide food for baby birds. Um, the, the oaks provide uh, or support more insects than any other plant or tree in our um, native plant palette. So if you have space for an oak, there's lots of oaks. I think we have about 26 species that are, um, most of them are grown commercially. This is sand live oak. So if you want a live oak, but you don't have the space for a live oak, you can consider a sand live oak. It has very similar um, leaves, but it doesn't get as big, doesn't spread out as much. Its um, acorns are low in tannin, so it's an important food source for many animals and some birds, especially the Florida scrub jay, if you happen to live near scrub jay or in scrub jay habitat. And it is a larval host for the oak hair streak, the red banded hair streak. I think there's a couple more. So it's just an all around like, you know, ecosystem unto itself, but evergreen, um, great plant to have. It does, so it does lose its leaves, um, but it's, it's not deciduous. So it just pushes out its old leaves as its new leaves are coming in. So it's never without leaves, but it does lose them. And that too can be a good source of mulch. Um, it is a little denser than your pine straw is going to be, 
Um, but that's, I have a stand live oak in my front yard and that's what I use for mulch um, is leaf litter. So, and I do have a lot of wildflowers that have managed to um, maneuver their way around the leaves. So um, the last plant I wanna talk about uh, is, is saw palmetto. Um, I used to I used to hate this plant because it's everywhere. No matter where you go in Florida, there's a saw palmetto, and I just did not appreciate it. But I actually planted three of them in my native plant landscape because they are um, probably the most amazing plant in Florida. Um, there have been over 300 species of wildlife that utilize this plant. Um, it's extremely valuable to hundreds of birds and mammals. Um, and insects, and it's an excellent source of food and cover. Um, the flowers are a major source of nectar for honeybees, and of course honey is one of Florida's um, new burgeoning um, agriculture crops, um, as we're kind of seeing problems with citrus and some other um, of our more prominent <laughs> agriculture. Um, honey is really coming into um, the four here in Florida and saw palmetto is in the top three nectar sources. So the flowers are these long stalks of white. You can see the bee on it in the bottom photo, but they have this just wonderful sweet scent. They bloom in the spring. Um, the fruits are a major food source for the Florida black bear. We can also eat them, but they don't taste very good. It kind of tastes like, like tobacco juice. <laughs> but again, if you add sugar, um, you know, everything's good. Um, but the plant itself is slow growing, it's long lived. You can use it as a specimen or um, plant a bunch of them and group them to form a low buffer, especially where you want to discourage foot traffic. Um, this is another one that is armed. It's petiole or it's um, leaf stalk are lined with these tiny little teeth, hence the name saw palmetto. Um, so it's great for discouraging traffic um, or foot traffic. But it really has, a, a, you know, it's, it's a different looking plant, so it really can provide um, interest in your landscape, um, something different than your, your typical um, herbaceous wildflowers. And, and, um, but again, providing lots and lots of resources as well. So these are just a handful of the many, many plants that are native to Florida that are easy to grow that are readily available at native nurseries and that can give your landscape real Florida style and provide those vital resources for wildlife, um, which of course will help establish those pathways and those habitats that wildlife need in this um, you know, landscape where we are just developing and developing. If you need help getting started, um, we, the Florida Wildflower Foundation have tons of resources to help. Um, visit our website at flawildflowers.org and you will find over 300 plant profiles um, as well as downloadable versions of all of our um, brochures. We have this Attracting Birds, Butterflies and Bees series. We have this 20 easy to grow wildflowers. Um, lots of handouts um, on how to choose wildflowers and other plants for your landscape. In the next few weeks, we'll be debuting guides for shady, dry, and aquatic landscapes. And we are in the process of having all of our handouts and brochures translated into Spanish, which is super exciting. Um, and of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention um, my own book. Um, yes, this is a slight shameless plug, but it is an excellent resource um, for adding native plants to your landscape. Um, we really tried to take the guesswork out of going native and give an easy to use guide for selecting planting and caring for native plants. Um, so that is available as well on our website. But um, just to you know, go back to Doug Tallamy again, everybody with, a patch of, or with access to a patch of earth can make a difference. Even the smallest garden can provide food and shelter for wildlife. Um, if all you have is a tiny patio and you can only put a, a container on the, that's fine. That is something. Whatever you have, whatever you can do, um, you know, do it. Let's work to turn our landscapes into real habitat because we need to, you know, we need to mitigate the damage that's done with all this development. Florida is an awesome place to be and lots of people keep coming here and that's 
fantastic, but we need to make sure that we are, you know, putting a lot of those resources back and, and our urban landscapes are the only frontier left. So um, don't think you don't have the space or, um, you know, the ability to do it because you do. So thank you. Um, thanks to Electoral Conservation Trust for having me and for you all um, listening. If you have, um, you know, if you're looking for information, please check out our website, Facebook, Instagram, and certainly, um, I know we have questions coming up, but if you don't get to them, um, you are uh, welcome to email me directly. Um, and with that said, I will hand it back over. Stacy, thank you so much for uh, joining us. <laughs> I learned so much and I feel really inspired um, to get out my yard and start planting stuff and uh, trying some new things. So thank you so much for the inspiration and the new ideas. Um, we have a bunch of questions on our, on our chat here. Uh, so let's get started with that. You ready? Ready. Okay, so I'm just going to start in the beginning here. Um, the first question was from Gail, and she's, she asks, what exactly is the definition of native? Oh, <laughs> yeah, this could be hard. <laughs> That's a fun one. Um, so <laughs> where do I start? So it is a an arbitrary demarcation in a sense that we have basically we look at we and not just we the foundation but the scientific community the native plant society um you know anyone talking about native plants are kind of looking at the time when um european settlers arrived here on the shores when they came was the plant here or not the reality is, is we didn't really start keeping track of or, or didn't have good botanical records until you know that was the 1500s when they came here generally speaking or what we demarcate as that nativity line. We didn't really have good botanical records until into the 17, 1800s. So while we've decided this is the time that we, you know, this is now where we're looking at, um, there is a lot of uncertainty um, with regard to, but we, you know, we have to draw a line somewhere. And so just looking at when, um, was the plant here in our botanical records? Is there genetic um, evidence that it's been here since we showed up on the shores, then that's kind of how we um, determine it to be native. And to some degree, I mean, just simply, I mean, that's a great answer. I knew you would know all the, all the right, <laughs> all the right <laughs> answers there, but just to some degree, um, like if something is, you know, commercially grown and hybridized, of course, that isn't considered native, right? It's native is something that you find in an actual ecosystem. Just right. And in the nursery trade, there are, you know, people are developing cultivars of native species. And there's some gray area as to some cultivars are accepted as native, some aren't. Um, you know, it's it's a very confusing world when you get into horticulture and, and actual development of plants. Um, but, but yeah, as you said, it, it was the plant, does it exist in the wild? Can you see it somewhere? Maybe it only exists in one tiny little, you know, corner of the Apalachicola National Forest, but it was here, it is here, and, um, you know, growers can still grow it and make it available. Thank you. Um, a question from Bezad says, how would you know what plant is native? Say milkweed. How do I know that the one I have is native? Do they look different? They do. There's a lot of variation in leaf form in the plant's habit, whether it's herbaceous or woody. Um, the flower itself, they all have very different looking flowers. Um, really, if you already, if you're purchasing the milkweed, you, again, I'm going to keep saying it, go to a native nursery because they obviously are growing natives, but they can tell you what they're selling. If it's something you already have in your landscape, um, you can take a picture and send it to us. We, we identify plants all the time for people. Um, I just downloaded an app called Picture This. And you can take a picture and it tells you 
it's like 70% accurate. So I, I wouldn't guarantee that it's, you know, but it gives you a good starting point too, if that's something you're interested in. Um, but definitely if you don't know and you're concerned, take a picture, um, send it to us, send it to a Native Plant Society chapter or um, go on Facebook. We have lots of um, native plant groups that are more than happy to tell you whether your plant's native or not. Good ideas there. Um, another, oh, just a statement from Gail, and I'll just read this out to everybody, um, that there is a drive-through native plant sale going to take place on April 2nd at the Natural History Museum in Gainesville, um, and you can go to their website and get the details. They have some great stuff. I got some native milkweed from there a year or two ago, and it's just done so well in my little garden. Awesome. Um, okay, John asks, why aren't invasive species banned from sale? <laughs> I don't know, but I wish they were. I don't, I, I honestly, I, I wish I had an answer. I don't know why um, that is not, uh, you know, because we do have laws that prohibit the sale and interstate trade of invasive animals. So I, I don't, I honestly don't know why, but I really wish some legislator would take it on because I, I, I think it, it needs to happen. Yeah. I the fact that I can go to a big box store and buy a lantana is just beyond, and there's nothing saying this is invasive. You may not want to buy it. It seems like it is kind of um, a, maybe a politicized thing, you know, just that, um, you know, there's a, the horticulture lobby might have something to do with it. And that's my guess. <laughs> that's possible. But the state of Florida spends, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions, annually managing invasive species. So it, it, there should be a law, yeah, says right. Stacey. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, Janice asks, is purple lovegrass recommended? I know you were talking about Elliot's lovegrass, but is purple lovegrass something? We yeah, have? yeah, purple lovegrass is um, Aragrass suspectabilis. It's, uh, yes, it's a native. Um, it's just as delightful as the one I have, it just has purple instead of white, but um, it's pretty adaptable, um, kind of offers you the same, um, you know, resources and, and ha likes the same conditions as the Elliot's. Um, Scott asks if there will be plant lists available after the presentation. Of what's in my um, talk? I, I can. Suppose. I can send that to you if you if there's a way you can post it or I, I don't know how you can share it, but I'd be happy um, to do that. Probably uh, is your email or is there a way to like email you to if somebody wanted that or yeah uh, for sure yeah uh, yeah we'll figure that out <laughs> we'll figure that one out but um what do you think we Heather? can totally do that we can totally do that <laughs> okay Thank you. yeah I can certainly give a list. Okay. Um, for folks, for folks who haven't been to our website, we'll put it up where we put the recording of the talk on our Flo Keep Florida Wild series page. So we'll put it with the talk. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. Okay. Next question, also from Janice. Um, how close do the Yopon male and female plants have to be? Um, she says, I seem to have female in the front yard and males in the backyard. I, you know, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I would, I, I don't know. <laughs> I've got mine just a couple feet apart, but um, that's just because that's where I wanted them. I wasn't really thinking about proximity, um, but I, I don't know. I think, you know, I want to say if it's line of sight, but I don't even know that. <laughs> I am not going to pretend to think like a bee. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I guess if a bee can fly as far as the two plants, maybe? I don't know. Well, I mean, bees travel, you know, up to a mile, some bees. So, but I, I don't know. I don't know how they, <laughs> they know where the plants are, but then that's also baffling to me. Like, you know, I, I put this whole native landscape in and now I've got all these pollinators. It's like, who, who told them? How did they, I mean, of course it's nature, but um, yeah, I don't know. I would think, I would think that front and backyard would probably still be like, that's still pretty close proximity. Yeah. You'll know when you get little berries on your front yard. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Okay, James asks, uh, where do you get your wildflower seeds besides those you saved from last year's dried flowers? Um, FloridaWildflowers.com is the seed cooperative. So they work with, they are a cooperative of, I'm not sure how many farmers, I think there's a dozen or so um, farmers who specifically grow wildflowers to produce seed. Um, and they do sell, they, they contract with DOT, so they do sell some of the stuff that DOT puts on the roadside. So they're not, they don't, they're not exclusively native, but they do have a lot of native plant, of native species available on their website. And some local nurseries are starting to um, collect and package seeds. So if you have a nursery in your area, um, you can check with them and see if they happen to have what you're looking for or if they sell native seeds. I would also say, um, ask your friends, because <laughs> a lot of times oh, yeah. we'll be growing things and we'll just trade seeds with each other. So that's, yeah. that's, that's a great um, idea. Let's see. Uh, oh, and if you're in um, Alacho County, there's a place called Working Food and they do um, a lot of vegetable seeds, but I think they have some native plant seeds also. I'm not, not entirely sure about that, but Working food is a or grow hub. Grow it's hub. They have a native plant garden there that was funded in part by a grant from the Florida Wildflower Foundation. But you can go there and see, um, you know, a nice little demonstration garden and see how you can add some of those plants to your landscape too. And they I also say, have have plants for sale. So they have like butterfly weed and some of the native. I was just going to say, I know they've been harvesting seeds too and growing. So yeah, they do they do sell um, a good bit of natives resource here in Gainesville. Okay, um, let's see. Andrew asks, when trying to include natives in our home landscapes, is it acceptable to, do, to judiciously collect plants from the wild? Uh, uh, short answer, no. <laughs> um, generally, you need a permit to collect anything from uh, natural lands. Um, so no, it is not advisable to do that. Even collecting seed is, is really discouraged, um, especially you know, if a plant is, is threatened or endangered, you, you don't wanna uh, run the risk of you know, eliminating a wild population, but um, no, definitely don't encourage that. I know that um, you know, it's actually illegal in a lot of our mm -hmm. natural lands and like public lands, um, yeah. so yeah. don't, get caught doing that by any means, <laughs> um, you know, and it's, it's definitely not, not encouraged in general, but if you're, if you know somebody that has something growing on their land, you can ask them. That's always a, that's always a idea, but definitely don't dig up anything that is uh, rare or, <laughs> you know, <laughs> as Stacy said, be judicious. Um, okay. Uh, Janice asks, do you recommend East Palatka holly? And I think, isn't that a type of um, dahoon holly? I think it's a type of dahoon, yeah. Um, I, I, it really depends on the conditions of your landscape. Um, I, I know dahoon holly is one that is generally um, commercially available. So if it's the right plant for your landscape, then, then sure. I mean, all of the hollies that are commercially available are gonna provide great resources for wildlife, so. Um, oh, this is something I can relate to. Annie asks, um, I have, well, she says, I have baby lover gra grasshoppers covering my young firebush. Do I just let them eat it? I read mama birds will feed them to their young, but thinking it will be eaten to nothing. <laughs> so I have, I have two approaches to this. Um, one is I can't kill anything, so um, I I don't I don't like to say it, but I I know how destructive they can be. Um, they're a problem at one of our, our other grant gardens that I just visited, uh, and their approach is kill them all. Um, they are toxic. I don't know at what point in their life cycle they become toxic, but they generally aren't eaten by, bir um, by birds. The loggerhead shrike is the only one I know of that does eat it because the shrike actually like hangs its food and like cures its meat. 
which I think helps to, uh, you know, eliminate or reduce the toxicity, but I don't think a lot of birds eat the lovers. Um, so even though I don't ever like to say kill anything, um, I, I know that they're, they're just, they're not good. They're not good. Um, what is your thought on this, Grace? Well, you, I'm not going to say what I do with them, but <laughs> I'll tell you what my neighbor used to do. She used to gather them in a paper bag, like a brown paper bag, and take them across the street and let them go. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. It was like a natural area across the street, but she didn't want them in her, in her yard. But I wasn't as kind. I'll just leave it that way. They can be very destructive. I do know that. So um, I, I'll leave it at that. I don't know that leaving them on your fire bush is really what you want to do in your home landscape. Um, but I just don't have the heart to kill anything. I'm thankful they're not in my landscape. <laughs> We'll see once you get lovers. <laughs> uh, please don't wish that on me. I, I don't. I don't at all. <laughs> um, okay, Kat says, I live on 12 acres near Gainesville, and I have a west-facing yard, side yard, that is mostly weeds, but I want to keep a lot of them, um, like Biden, spiderworts, violets, Yes. a yes. small ground cover type plant that has little white flowers that bloom in early spring. Um, any suggestions about how to encourage more wildflowers and introduce native plants without hurting the ones that are already there? Careful hand weeding of the plants. I don't want to be there, question mark. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we've looked at doing this um, in a couple parks here. Um, where we kind of want to manage it wild and see what happens. But if you have the time and the willingness to kind of go through and pull out the undesirables, um, you can even add in some desirables, um, maybe choosing some that are prolific self-seeders, things that can, I mean, there's not a lot that can compete with Biden's, but there are some plants that can grow alongside it and, and survive. But um, you know, adding a few here and there that are going to reproduce well um, might be a good way to try and get the get that going. Um, you could also try adding seed. Um, it depends on how dense that coverage is of, of the weeds. That it might not, you know, it might not be successful. Seeds kind of hit or miss anyway because not all seed is viable. You, I mean, it is tested for viability, but it's, you know, there's no guarantee just by planting a seed, you're going to get what you want. So um, that might be less, um, I don't know, less successful. But, you know, if you've, if you've got the time to care for it, I would definitely hand weed and just try adding some here and there and, um, you know, see what happens. But there's other plants that are mentioned are really, I mean, Biden's is, I said saw palmetto was in the top three. Biden's is in the top three nectar sources. So it's a really important plant for honey production and really important plant for pollinators in general. And you can eat it. You can make a salad out of it. <laughs> I will never plant Biden's. <laughs> I'm just I trying. wouldn't plant it, but you know, <laughs> if it occurs. Uh, um, yeah. I've had luck just putting like a couple of Coreopsis plants or Gallardia. Oh, I know that there's, well, anyway, um, and they just reseed. Uh, yeah, like, yeah. You just put a couple plants one year and the next year you've got little plants everywhere. Um, asters are just, great because asters yeah. produce so many seeds. So yeah, any any aster that's appropriate for the type of soil and whatever is going to be, is probably going to be your best bet because it's going to just reseed itself. Yeah, Coreopsis is a good example. Um, let's see. We've got a bunch of questions. This is great. Uh, I've got a couple comments. Uh, Julie says, Stacy's book is excellent. I purchased it last year and it's a great resource for native plants. So thank you for your book. Glad to hear that. And Carlos says, thank you so much. Uh, very informative and inspiring. Um, Kat asks, any special soil amendments to plant the natives you talked about? Mel's mix? Any special instructions for planting native species? I've never used any soil amendment. Um, really, it's you can get your soil tested if you want to go to that uh, extent and, and find out exactly what you're dealing with and choose plants that are suitable. 
Um, or you can take your chances and just look at soil moisture and, you know, general conditions, which is what I've done. Um, haven't lost a plant yet. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you're picking the right plant for the soil uh, as it exists, then you, you shouldn't need to amend it. Um, there are plants that do great in dry, sandy, nutrient-poor soils, uh, other plants that really require, um, you know, different levels of acidity or, or nutrient levels. So you, you just kind of have to examine what you've got and find the plants that are suited for that. Um, I don't have any experience about it uh, with amendments to really speak to that, though. But, um, but you know, with natives, you, you really don't have to go there. Um, Hi, Sammy. <laughs> Sorry, I don't. Yeah, she's tired of uh, she's tired of waiting on me here. <laughs> uh, Gail says, "Excellent presentation." Thank you. Um, <laughs> let's see. Lindsay says, "I'd love, love, love to provide a service of helping strangers set up their own." Florida native wildflower garden, although I wouldn't have any idea on where to start, how to go about it, except to make a post online. What do you think about that? Have any suggestions? What would you recommend I read to get started? Stacy's <laughs> book, that's a great way to get started. And, um, you know, I would, I'm just gonna say, I would say post that on Facebook. Um, that's a great way to um, get that kind of information out there that you're available. Um, for sure. And I mean, you know, I, yes, I want to promote my book, but there's lots of books out there that, um, you know, have a different approach, but still offer good advice on using native plants and native wildflowers. Um, Craig Hegel has quite a few books um, for different, you know, he's got one on wildlife, one on shady landscapes. Um, they're all really good information and um, all of the books out there highlight, there's some overlap, but there's a lot of different species that are included. So, you know, I definitely, if this is something you want to do, read, <laughs> read lots of material. Um, our website has a lot of resources, not only our own, but we link to a lot of different um, resources too. So that might be a good place to start just to kind of get an understanding of, um, you know, what does it take to, to start a wildflower garden and what are the things you need to know? But I think that's awesome. You want to help other people do it. Trivet, oh, sorry. Tristan asks, how do you collect seeds? Um, it depends on the species. Um, you know, d depending on the plant, some plants, um, like asters for in particular have, a, they produce a lot of seeds um, that you can sometimes just pop the flower head right off. Um, some plants that are more wind dispersed, um, you can cut the whole seed head off right before it starts to go away or even like um, put a little paper bag or a mesh bag over it. Um, Milkweed, well, milkweed, if you get the pod as it starts to split, um, that's an easy way to capture those seeds. It really just depends on the plant um, because they all have different types of seeds. You just want to pay attention to it. Um, if you're, you know, collecting from your own landscape, keep an eye on the plants as they start going to seed. And when they start turning brown, when they don't look as fleshy or as green, um, that's the time that you want to pay attention to them and, um, you know, Again, you can, I, I just cut a lot of seed heads off, like in whole or as whole seed flower heads um, once the seeds start maturing. Um, but it, it dip, the wind dispersed ones are the hardest because if you don't get them at the right time, they're just going to blow. Goldenrod is like that. I'll keep watching it and watching it and then all of a sudden it's gone. Or I hit the plant when I'm going to cut it and poof, it all goes away. But, you know. There, there's always more behind it, so. Okay, one more. Um, well, I've got two more statements. Uh, there's, oh, here's one more question from Tristan. Do you encourage tree seeds like Royal Point Sienna? Tree seeds. 
Like starting a tree from seed? That, um, I'm not I mean, sure. yeah, I'm not sure either. Um, I mean, for me, if I want a tree, I want to buy one that a grower's already spent that time on because starting a tree from seed is, that's a long, long process. I'm, not sure. asking. I'm not super familiar with uh, plants in South Florida, but I'm not sure that Royal Poinciana is native. Do you know? I don't, I was thinking that too. I don't, I don't think so. Yeah, I'm, I kind of think it's not, but I could be wrong about that. Um, Annie says, Stacy, I'm a newbie to native plants and I call your book my plant Bible. It's been oh, such a valuable resource. Thank you so much. And uh, one more thank you from Ruth. Great discussion and presentation. Thank and uh, also one more statement from Annie. She says, just finished Doug Tallamy's book, Nature's Best Hope. And he mentioned keystone trees. Any keystone plants or wildflowers you recommend for Central Florida? She lives in Pinellas. Um, I, you know, I think oak, if you, if you can put an oak in your landscape, I, I think that is like, if there's only one plant you can put, well, of course it's a tree, you need a lot of space for it, but um, you know, an oak is one of those that just provides everything. So, um, but yeah, I don't know. Um, saw palmetto is another good one. Um, wildflowers, I don't know, there's so many of them, it's really hard to name it like a, you know, Probably, probably Biden's. Don't shoot me, even though that's not one you want to plant, but. Well, that's just my personal preference, but you're allowed to like Biden's. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. And we're going to wrap it up here. I just want to, before you go, everybody, um, I just want to say um, a big thank you to Stacy for joining us tonight. Thank you. And also, if you're interested in joining us, um, our next Florida Wild Series webinar will be um, on April the 20th at six o'clock, and it's called Leaving a Legacy of, uh, of Land Conservation. So it's going to be about conservation easements and specifically the Farm Bill. Um, so Erica and Emma from Alaska Conservation Trust will be um, answering your questions and telling you all about um, conservation easements and agricultural programs through the state and um, federal programs. So join us then. And in the meantime, enjoy your gardening and uh, plant all your flowers and have fun. And thank you so much, Stacy. Thanks so much for having me. It was fun.